Yes. Well, oh, I'm Stuart to begin with, and we'll introduce. Hello. Jolly good. Could I just tell people that you'll be speaking to the group? Yes, I will. And then you can have a look. Okay. Right, morning everybody. I'm Mark Holloway. And hello to you as well. And we've got a, hopefully we've got an audience on Facebook Live as well, which would be good. So this is the first time we've tried this with a walking around with a group of people and on there, so it should be fun. This is Stuart Clark. Morning everyone. Who's um, going to be talking about the ecology and birds. And we have Kate, who's not on a microphone at the moment. But uh, I can take my Hi. little... Hi. There we are. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> so let us know if um, any problems you can't hear us. Um, but uh, we're in for an extravaganza of archaeology, ecology, uh, geology with Kate, um, and anything else we can think of, some local history, as we go around for about an hour and a half this morning. And um, hopefully we will end up on the top of Hengsbury Head where we can all sit down and um, imagine what it was like several million years ago. Kate was going to take us through that journey and what it was like to be Stone Age people. Um, and um, hopefully, we, even when we're up there, Stuart and I were practicing the other day and we were doing a bit of sea watching. We, we saw a fulmer and a, a gannet, didn't we? Indeed. Right. So, are we going to? Uh, <laughs> are you're, we... going to, you're going to talk to this group, and I'm just going to film. So I'm incidental. <laughs> so, uh, would you like to go to Double Dykes first? Oh, Have we got yeah. time to go up on there? Yeah, yep. Okay. Right. Bad planning. <laughs> <laughs> This way. Yeah. Yes, I will. Yes. Yes. Kate was just saying to me, "Could I explain why the sheep are here?" Well, in fact, I'm going to pass it on to Stuart because uh, he's mainly responsible for the sheep being here. <laughs> so it's your fault. This. Uh... It's, it, it is my fault, if you want to say that. <laughs> no, not entirely my fault, but grazing management is very important to us, not just, just here with the, with the, with the sheep, um, mainly because it does help to keep the, the scrub down. If, the, if we just left this area, didn't do any management at all, it would just completely scrub over. And you see here the bramble and gorse. Now, scrub is good. The patches of scrub are great. And just behind me here, this way, you can see some house sparrows. I've just heard a white throat which nest in this in this scrub. But too much scrub, we don't we don't want because this open grassland, this lots of little plants that, that, that grow in here, other other birds, other other animals that that, that love this habitat. And of course, we've got this fantastic uh, archaeology. These um, the double dikes here and. Mark and Kate say more about that. There's a barrow over over, over here, so it's really sort of emphasising those. I mean, the little part of the of the landscape of Hengisby Head that, that everyone everyone knows. So we've got the we've got the sheep here, the Potswold sheep, um, doing a fantastic job. We've also we've, we'll perhaps see some later. We've got some uh, rare breed cattle here, and on the cliff tops we've got some goats grazing because again the, the cliffs are a fantastic habitat which is being overwhelmed by lots of um, non-native plant species like bamboo and privet and home oak and the goats are doing a great job at restoring the habitats there which means that things the, the natives like sand lizards are, are coming back in there and Dartford warblers are, are nesting and, and spreading out again so that's the, that's the reason for the grazing I, you know there's a lot more to it the, than that but that's the, the the brief summary of that while we have our grazing animals here and of course they're very popular people love to see them it's a, again it's a great experience isn't it you come here and you can see the sheep and the cattle and it's and it's really part of the place and yeah generally people really get it and understand it and understand often we have issues with the with the fence, putting fencing up but I think people actually get it that we need to have the fencing if we're going to have those, the, the animals. Right, that's, that's great. Thank you, Stuart. And so um, in the background, we have 
and Peter will whiz around and have a look at that. We've got the double dikes, which runs between the uh, sea and down to the harbour. Um, and if you were here in Iron Age times, the double dikes, the big two, two banks and two ditches, would have run out into the harbour. But since then, the, um, we've, the land is... Uh, um, uh, we've, we've actually got... Uh, a lower sea level than we had 2,000 years ago. So as a marsh is formed round the other end of the, the dike, so they seem to run off into the, the marshland, the, 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 the brackish marsh which we have out there. So that's quite a good indication that obviously they wouldn't have just built it out there, they would want to try and build it out into the, into the harbour and then, and then round into the sea to make that sort of defensive shape. Um, so... Rather than going on to the top of there, this is a view, I don't know if you, you can see this here, but we'll show it to the camera in a minute, uh, of, of what it might have looked like if you're walking down the main road here. Um, it would have had a rampart on the top, probably a wooden rampart, and this entrance here would have been the main entrance into the headland. So it's a bit like a, a wall around your garden. It wouldn't have stopped people getting in if they really wanted to, but it's a bit of a sort of psychological defence, I think. Um, so that's a sort of reconstruction, and we'll show that to Peter so that we can uh, get a good view of that. Yeah. So, and just behind us, I don't know if you can point the camera um, at that mound over there. We'll do that while we're here, but you might be able to look over the fence, Peter. Is one of the 12 Bronze Age barrows on Hengisbury Head. And it's this, this, this lump that you've got in front of you here. So that was excavated at the beginning of the 20th century. And it's probably the most prominent one, although the, there are, as I say, 11 or 12 other ram barrows on Hengisbury Head. So in, in that one, there was a, crem uh, a cremation inside an urn, and the urn was turned upside down. And quite often the urns were upside down. It presumed it was to keep out evil spirits or something, some sort of tradition. And um, it was the remains of um, a Wessex chieftain, actually a woman, who's probably around about 25 or 26 years old. So I imagine there were enough bone fragments in there to be able to tell um, whether it was male or female and, and an age. Because on, a cremation, on the, the cremations that they did, they didn't necessarily you know, burn everything to ash. I've got a little picture here, which it might be difficult for you to see, but this is a, a, a reconstruction of what it might have looked like um, um, with a ga gathering of uh, people in the Bronze Age. And of course they had pretty reasonable clothing at that time, um, woven materials. And uh, so that's, um, and the barrows were mainly in, in view of the, um, the river and water. It was obviously quite important. So most of the barrows here at Angsbury Head are on the, the harbour side along the top of the, the headland and at, at looking out to here. And the next one, there's, a, there's one in the field just over here um, where the golf uh, course, where the uh, mini golf used to be. Then the next one down the river is at Wick, uh, if you know that, that. And they're all looking out towards the, where the river would have been. Right, so that's the beginning of the archaeology bit. Stuart will lead us on for a little bit now down the road, perhaps talk a little bit about the wildlife and the ecology, we'll put him on the spot and well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get cracking because, uh, yeah. Yeah. is that all right? Is it, Absolutely, I think just quicker we can work along as we are, but just, just while we've been here talking, there's been a white throat singing in the brambles here and that's come all the way, that's overwintered south of the Sahara Desert. So that's flown across the Sahara Desert, across the Mediterranean, across Europe to come to us in, in Hengisbury. And that, that may well, if that's be, uh, two or three years old, it's probably come back to the, the same spot. And the white throats, they, they will they'll nest here. Um, I've also been watching, there's a, a wading bird called a wimbrel, and we might see more of those. And again, that's what's called a passage migrant. That's been overwintering in probably West Africa. And it's coming here, it's, it sort of stops on its way and it's feeding up out there and that will end up going further north, even further north than Ringwood. So it's going, going to go a long, long way. It's probably up to the um, 
either in sort of Scotland or the Northern Isles or th maybe th as far as Northern Scandinavia to, to nest. And then they all come back down. Okay, so a really exciting time of the year uh, for all these birds. You never know what you're going to be seeing. So that's the sort of thing we'll be looking out for as, as, we, as we move along. Okay. Okay, everyone, we'll just uh, amble on. Um, yeah, sorry, we're just, uh, I've got my microphone on. I was just asking you whether, about the barriers going all the way down to... Um, Thank you. What was the second bird you mentioned? The first one was a white bird. A wimbrel. Wimbrel, yes, it's a, it's a wade bird. Do you know what a curl looks like? The golf it's course. a bit like a curl. Yeah, with... Lots of curlers, oh, right, indeed, yeah. 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 Don't see many here. Uh, they're in excavations steep done. Decline, unfortunately, yeah. like so many of our bird species. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll see some more. And um, uh, some offerings of crab apples, and it's one of the first times that they've ever found crab apples um, related to the like the Iron Age. Uh, yeah, so, um, wow. uh, yes. Person. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Absolutely. And um, so, yeah, that's, and so that, that find is actually in the, the uh, visitor centre um, and in the Iron Age section. The, the, yeah, so we've got, we've got um, part of that, uh, that uh, those finds and, and the crab apples are there and the human remains we have as well. Oh right, um, with beads, you see. Well, there was gold and amber, um, yeah, beads found in that's this uh, barrow that we've just been looking at just now, um, and um, I think uh, they're part of the um, the in the America state um, have quite a few collections of uh, artifacts from Hengistbury Head. But we have got um, uh, a reconstruction, and also there's, there's at the Red House Museum in Christchurch, there's a, there's a reconstruction of that as well. So, Stuart, we're up on the, coming up to the, the brow of the hill, overlooking Barnfield. Yeah, and I've just spotted one of our more familiar migrants. Whoa. The swallows just sort of darted over here. And this year, for some reason, there's not been many swallows at, at all yet. Hopefully, there's, there's lots more to come. But uh, just keep your eye out. I think it's probably feeding over the marsh here. Um, but again, what a really long distance migrant. That's, that's come all the way from South Africa. A few weeks ago, that would have been feeding them. A, amongst big game elephants and, and zephyr and, and, and all sorts of things like that. And then suddenly it's here and they, they do nest here, but again, some will, will move further uh, north as well. The very close relative of the swallow we've got is uh, sand martins, which again, as we go on the cliff top, that's hopefully something we'll see because they nest in the, they actually excavate little burrows in the sandy cliffs. So then they are nesting here, but again, some will, will pass through and go further further north into into Britain and as and of course lots the of swallows only breed at this end of their journey. Is that right, Stuart? Absolutely, absolutely. They, they come here and the, lots of food, etc., etc. I mean, really, they're 
it's probably classed as, as an African bird, really. We, I mean, we claim mm. as British birds, but they spend most of their, their, their time in Africa. And of course, all this migration going on, this is millions, tens of millions of birds moving around. But this time of year, mostly sort of moving north. But of course, you know, we, we, we've been talking about the, our ancestors who are living here, how they explained it. Suddenly a swallow appears. Now, where on earth did they suddenly come from? And there were all sorts of theories. They lived in the mud at the bottom of ponds or all sorts of things like that. Because, you know, it's obviously we, we know a lot more about our world today and what, what's going on, but those people wouldn't have. And trying to explain something like that would be fascinating, wouldn't it, to be able to go back and see. If they, they were standing here and suddenly saw that, that swallow flying about, how would they perceive that? What would be their appreciation of that bird? Fantastic to know, wouldn't it? Well, Kate's going to take us back in time when we get up there on our... Yeah, way past, um, way past the human bit, though. Absolutely. <laughs> our time, way past the our time bit, capsule. Actually, absolutely, well. yes. <laughs> <laughs> swallows, but not swallows. We'll talk a bit about them as we go on. I've never seen one. Ah. Right, right. <laughs> there should be loads Yes, there should be loads around, but they're just... Oh, right, yeah. We've got all the swallows yes. there. They come and nest and have their young every year. They always seem to be the same nest. Oh, really? Oh, right. Oh, okay. That'll be the sun martin. We will keep our eyes and ears open. We've got to find a swallow now. <laughs> It's always the case when you really want to see something, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, it won't be there. But... Pretend you don't want to see one. <laughs> okay. Keep your head, head down. I'll look at the geology. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cycle. If anybody asks you a, an interesting question or, or a non interesting question, you want um, people on here to hear it, you may need to repeat the question. Just because so, they may not pick it up. Although I am picking you up, I'm sure it's fine. Okay. This is you. <laughs> Oh, it's a, another migrant bird just flying over here calling. Did you know that? A quite harsh call. And there's, there's two of them there. There's white birds that look very gull like. They're actually terns. They're sandwich terns. And can you hear that sort of kiri kiri call? Going away into the distance. And again, they're overwintering West Africa. Um, but they're, they're here now. There's, obviously, here it's great for lots of food. And they, they do nest locally as well here. Yeah. Well, do you remember those were sort of stamped? Then, birds? did we ever identify what they were? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Yeah, I've never. Yeah. Was that Brent, Brent was geese, was that? There were a type of geese, weren't they? Yeah, but we're not, not as big. I've never seen before. Big beaks on them. Yeah. We said like storks, didn't we? Yeah. But not, not storks. You don't mean glossy ibis. Is that how big are they? The ibis is yeah. normally small. Yeah. Like so high with a, with a long curved beak. Oh, yeah, if there's a group, it wouldn't know. No, no, no.
Going in the nursery as well, aren't we? Right, we're heading up to um, the Iron Age site now, and um, which was excavated by Barry Cunliffe. It may be that as we get into the lee of the headland here and the, and the woodland, that we might have a reduction in signal. So um, if we just sort of cut off um, on the video or the audio, just bear with us. But it's always a bit, it's a bit of a weak signal as we go through the woodland. Um, but stick with us and um, <coughs> uh, let us know if you have any comments, likes, um, please ask questions. Peter's looking at the other side of the camera on the screen so he can see if any questions pop up and we'll try to answer them for you. Yeah, I hope we can see some more of those because of course they're nesting in here. So, uh, and you might have seen, have you seen them on the camera? Yes. We put all the cameras up and they, they decided not to nest. The nest, we've got cameras. The well, rest of them have gone on a bit too far ahead, so we're calling yes, them back. So, uh, we're going to have a little talk about the archaeology, the Iron Age archaeology here. Oh. And uh, summon. Get my <laughs> assistant. Yeah. That's a white throat. <laughs> That's what, that Kate, could you be my assistant? No, that's a white throat. <clears throat> if I gave you a couple of things to yes. hold in a minute, and um, and uh, no, it's not that one. There we are. Right. Yes. <laughs> Stuart, just fill in a second. I've just got to get some goodies out of my bag. So, uh... Hello. Well, we're just standing here. It's, uh, this is a really interesting area from a 
certainly from an ecological point of view. And if you can see at the back, and we'll get a bit closer to them, there's, uh, there's uh, some of our Shetland cattle grazing here at the moment. And, and you know, it, it's just fantastic for, for small birds in here. We've got, a, there was a white throat just singing, doing this little song flight and above our heads here. And that, that's, that, that song is all about territory. And that's saying, this is my patch. This is where I'm going, this is my nest. And it might also be a male trying to attract a, a, a female in there. So that's why that bird is, is singing and getting so excitable. But of course, there's lots of, lots of food in here for them. The, the dung from the animals is, is great for lots of uh, insect life. And, and so it all sort of works together here. Um, I've just seen, we, we're desperately trying to find another swallow. A couple of sand martins flying around here. Kate wants to see a swallow. <laughs> we, we will find her one. So uh, that was nearly two, two sand martins. But, and you can see that the harbour at the moment, is, it's quite high tide at the moment. But when it's lower tide, I'm pity really, because lower tide, there's lots of sandbanks out there. And they tend to attract sort of wading birds. Um, and perhaps when we, yeah. when we come back, the tide Thank may have you. gone out again. I've not actually checked the tide time, so I'm not sure what the situation is there. But, but obviously another great habitat. And that's the beauty of this site, all these different habitats here. You know, you look one way and you've got this, this estuarine, this harbour habitat, you've got the, the reed beds, you've got this lovely old ancient grassland. And we're gradually going into some, some woodland here, we've got the cliffs, and of course the, the, the sea itself. That's the reason, all those different habitats, is why we've got such a fantastic array of, of wildlife. And it's not just birds, we've got, you know, obviously reptiles and amphibians, it's a really famous site for Natajet toads, for example. So an amazing site for wildlife. Of course, lots of people as well, because it is a fantastic place to be, isn't it? Oh, anyway, thank you, Stuart. Uh, back over to, to Mark here. So, um, we're now standing on the site of um, where the Iron Age settlement was. There were two settlements here 2,000 years ago, uh, an early one and a later one. So the, the early one um, is, uh, is the one behind that. <laughs> there we are, it's all right. I don't know if you can see that, but you, you can come forward a little bit and we can show it to the camera in a minute. So the, the early settlement was just a little collection of um, roundhouses um, and people with a, a very lo local industry working here. And they knew how to work iron ore and the ironstone, which uh, you, we will see when we get up to the top of Hengsbury Head. And in actual fact, these people built um, a, the first double dikes which is not in the position that you can see it today. It actually was about halfway across this field between us and the double dikes. So if you go onto the, you can't see that today because most of it was probably dismantled and the material was used to build the bigger double dikes when this became much more important place. So we've got a sort of an earlier settlement here of low key iron ore working. And then you've got the, the later settlement when this became one of Britain's most important ports for a couple of hundred years. So if you ever want to see the other double dikes and you're really interested in um, the cross sections of the cliff face, you can go along to the beach, walk this way about 90 metres and you'll see in the cross section of the cliff the, the cut where they actually dug out the material and then bounded it up, and I'm sure Kate yep. will confirm that. So it's, that's quite interesting, and um, it, it's not a lot of people know that, really. I don't suppose many people know that there's this cross-section of an earlier dike. So can you imagine building those dikes, though, with just with, with very limited materials, you know, and baskets and, and um, uh, just putting material in and then carrying it up to the top and very, very limited materials. They, they would have had iron um, uh, implements and, and uh, uh, spades and things like that, but it would have been very, very uh, time consuming and, and a, a, a long process. We know the, uh, these, these people were living here because so much pottery has been found here and it was Professor Barry Cunliffe who excavated here in the 1980s uh, over four years and um, uncovered lots of pottery. You're welcome to have a piece, but you'll have to uh, wash your hands afterwards if you want to have a look. But it has this very typical black um, uh, colour, which is very typical of the this sort of gerotogen 
pottery. It's a local tribe, a, a Celtic tribe that was here. And um, they, pro they probably used local clay, um, which in fact, um, behind me, over my shoulder, if you're looking on the, on the camera, all the way up through the river valley here, you can find this clay about one metre down. It's, uh, it's quite a, a nice grey colour. And we've actually excavated some of it, haven't we? And, and tried to make pots and, 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 and the like out of it. So that's what you're looking for. If you walk along this beach, you can still find pottery today. It's nice if you hand it in, if you, if you find any but otherwise it's just going to be lost to the sea and it's, it's falling out of these banks. And underneath here, we had the, um, the other settlement that Kate's got, the other picture, the more, more established one. And there we are. And you can see a boat pulled up here and these lovely roundhouses, um, which people lived in and cooked in. Um, there would have been uh, furnaces for smelting um, iron ore. They would have worked shale and other precious metals. And of course, at this time, people were coming here um, from the continent. So wine it was the main produce being brought from Italy and other things like Mediterranean glass, wine and olives in um, large um, containers. I'll put you on there. Thank you. So here, actually we'll just show you there, is a much larger piece of pottery and it's got, it is slightly curved and so that tells you if you followed that curve round it would be quite a big, quite a big vessel. Well it's actually part of an amphora which you've probably seen which have those sort of pointy ends and they, they would have been stacked on these boats that came here. So they were bringing um, wine, olives and other nice luxury goods in and we were exporting um, uh, precious metals that was coming from like Wales, um, uh, silver, um, we would have, there would have been uh, tin um, and, and other precious metals being brought to Hengisbury and then exported back for the boats that had, had arrived here. So they went on this journey from Italy up through France, out onto the west coast of France um, and then up the west coast, round to Cherbourg, and then the last leg, and then they would have gone back, back the same way. But we were also exporting things that you can't see um, evidence of, things like slaves and hunting dogs would have been a major trade. We know that from inscriptions uh, uh, and the like that we find in Italian, at the, the Italian end. So, um, so it was all happening here 200 years ago. Britain's most important port, believe it or not. And then it, it, then it went into decline and most of the trade happened further east, which is much uh, shorter um, uh, distance between, you know, obviously down what would have been the southeast of England and across to the, to the, uh, to the continent. So that's the Iron Age. We're going to no other questions um, we're going to carry on and we're going to go into the, the bird sanctuary we're going to try the bird sanctuary um, for the first time have a look at the ponds in there we're, Stuart's going to talk to us about some of the bird life hopefully we can talk about some of the plants because some of the, what we wanted to do today was talk about some of the plant life and perhaps what was around 2,000 years ago 5,000 years ago uh, into the old stone age and what how were people um, feeding themselves and what, what is around today and what bird life is around today which was around then. So um, we'll crack on. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's it never went up.
Okay. So we're just um, now ambling along to the bird sanctuary. We call it the bird sanctuary, but the, the nursery, which was in the 1940s after the Second World War, was an area that was... Well, originally it was an area that um, Lord Selfridge was created um, to grow lots of plants and uh, other things for his plans for building a castle on Hengsbury Head. Well, none of that ever came about. But in the late 40s, um, Bournemouth Council then took it on as one of their nurseries. So it got laid out in a quite a formal way, but over time it's just uh, um, reverted back to woodland. Um, so we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to try and see if we can uh, get a signal in there and uh, have a look at some of the plants and things. We, as we amble along, you probably just hear voices because um, we're, we're just walking in as a group here. Um, I, we may not be talking, or I, Stuart or I might not be talking, but just to enjoy the walk. Um, and don't be too concerned about the background noises because that's probably just the people we're talking to here. <laughs> so just enjoy the walk and a bit of peace and quiet now and see if we can hear any of the uh, skylarks and other things that are around. Yeah, so if you come to the gate, where's the where's Mark? Okay, Mark, are we going to go in through the, the gate here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just advancing too, look. Okay. But what just made them still an endangered breed uh, on the rare breeds register, but um, yes, and that's, that's a different. That's still Shetland, but they've got a different genetic makeup, so gives them that sort of reddy brown colour. So and they're beautiful animals, and you can see that they look quite ferocious. Got these great big Viking horns, but they are. Very gentle. Um, obviously, we wanted that because we wanted to be able to handle them. Yeah. Um, and they do a brilliant job for us. It's and all. Well. I remember the first one coming on here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're great because they're very, very hardy. You can imagine on yeah. these Shetland cattle. It's and they will they will quite happily um, live outside all through the year, even through the harshest winters. They'll they'll be out here. And they're, they're quite happy. I would think probably at the moment much happier than they would be on a freezing January snowy day. But you can see looking very, very content. And just generally being part of our conservation, doing a, a, a great job for us here. The, the Galloway, yeah, well, the, the Galloway, we've got belted Galloway, and they've, they're called belted because they're all black, but they've got a, a white band oh, uh, around it, so, yeah, it's all fish. 
Um, we've just been, see at the moment we've been looking at mainly birds, but looking at some plants, if you can sort of look down in front of us here, can you see this little red plant? Yeah. Obviously very, very easily overlooked. Most people would just trample over that yeah. without even knowing it was there. It's actually quite a rare plant. It's called mossy stonecrop. And it just loves these, yeah, it just loves this sort of really acid, um, sandy ground. And it, that's one of the things, if this was all scrubbed over, that's the sort of thing that we would actually, we would lose. It likes, it likes this sort of trampling and keeping that, gra that ground open. You can see it's, it's going to be not particularly uh, um, competitive, certainly with, with grasses and certainly with things like the, the bramble. So... And if we really looked at it, well, and uh, I think that, that that's the thing. Yeah. You, you know, most most people would just not yeah, notice that. Yeah. And here's, yeah, and you can <laughs> see, say hello. these are big beasts. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> yeah, they're just curious. It's going to have a look. Probably even actually slightly overweight, but. Uh, um, there we are. I don't know if well I, think, I think she may well be pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. But looking very, very healthy indeed. And, and obviously, you know, it's a prime concern of ours to make sure that Looks all of our grazing too. animals. Sorry? Looks it does very content, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Gentlemen. Just looking a bit dozy, actually. I might have a morning nap in a minute. So let's. Uh, Oh, I think they're used to lots of people. That's the, that's the great thing. They don't, they just see it as something natural, normal for them. There's nothing to worry about. You see, big patches of the, the, the mossy, mossy stone crop there. They are. That's, Oh, there would be a helicopter coming over just as there's something. You'll hear when the helicopter has gone. So this. This has always been a sanctuary area in here, which is great. It's, it's nice. It's nice that people can wander at will, but it's also really nice for wildlife to have some quiet areas. And uh, I think most people do actually get that as well. Um, you're going to be very privileged today because we're actually going to go, go, go in there, and that, that's okay. Every so often, that, that doesn't matter. But in here, we've got we have a, a heronry up in the, the, the conifers, so we've got um, grey herons. And these days, of course, little egrets have, have moved in. And it's almost certain at some point we'll probably get cattle egrets and great white egrets, which, the, which is certainly spreading uh, north and have started to breed in, in Britain now. And what I was going to point out to you, there's a sort of harsh call over here. We've got, um, we've done very well actually, we've, we've, we've got a kestrel box up here. And it has actually got a camera on, so you can, you can actually watch it live. But... There are, I'm not sure, Mark, are there young in there at the moment? Or there's five there? eggs in there. So there's... Yeah. So you can see that on the uh, Parks, Bournemouth, well, it's not, it's the Parks Foundation, it was Bournemouth Parks Foundation, but there's two cameras streaming on there, yeah, yeah. And, the, and that's got five eggs. Yeah. And so, probably the female will be brooding, the male going out hunting for, for her and for himself. And one of their favourite pra praises, you've seen them coming on with this thing dangling from, <laughs> from their talon and all their... Uh, and it's usually common lizards or um, slow worms. They will also take lots of, of small mammals. But here, because there's so many uh, common lizards, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a chief prey for them. I actually saw one catch one the other day here. Actually, I'm going to bring it straight over here. So, But they're doing really well. Um, like I say, five eggs there. So most years they do actually fledge all those eggs will hatch and they, they will fledge. So it just shows that there's lots of prey, lots of great habitat for them, for them here. Um, there's also a tawny owl box in here, and I, I don't know. If, it's always difficult to know no, if they're, they're nesting enough. Often it's, uh, we get stock doves 
moving in. But then suddenly the tawny owls will arrive, and of course they just boot out the, the, the stock goods. And we have a bit of a problem with grey squirrels, um, unfortunately, and the. Um, but um, they, they, they tend to build a dray or something in there, and then, <laughs> then come the stock doves. And the <laughs> in fact, talking of stock doves, can you hear that? Ooh, ooh. What? Not that, that's a wood pigeon behind me, it's over here. Yeah, yeah. I hear that. Yeah. That's one of the, that. Yeah. that was one of the herons at the nest. Let's go in, let's see what we can find. Did you bring your little magical box with the sounds on it today, Stuart? <laughs> I think that's the real thing. Have you looked? No, no. We're going to have a look while we're here. So we've got a. Right, oh, it's great anticipation. The fantastic way of finding out what. Bit of old pit or anything. It looks. I mean, Mark, we came around the other day, we just found this in near the pond, so we've put it down here. I'm going to lift that up and there'll be nothing underneath it. But <laughs> <laughs> there's always a chance of at least a slow worm, if not adder or grass snake. But let's, uh, let's have a look. And as predicted, absolutely nothing. But let's, uh, I think I might be able to find you something yet. But look on these edges. This, this time in the morning, of reptiles, it's not obvious, you might not know, but because they're, they're cold blooded, they need to get their body up to temperature before they can get active. So these sort of they will just bask and get their, get their, their body temperature up so they can actually get moving. Then. And they don't like to be out too long because obviously they're vulnerable. Kestrels will, will, will get them more. So that's the kestrel. So that will be, I should think, probably the male has just brought some food in and they get quite excited and there's been a bit of pair bonding and going, going on. So it's, uh, yeah, really, really nice to hear and nice to know that they're, they are nesting here. So, let's have a look. You never know. <laughs> OK, we've got ants. <laughs> I was a bit, a bit more hopeful for that because that's, when we looked last time, there were, there were two young slow worms under there. But... So it was, at least it's not like the BBC <laughs> Stuart, where they were definitely made sure there was something up put under there beforehand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's a real thing. This, this, is <laughs> this is authentic. Yes. <laughs> so what have you got there, Mark? Oh, right. I've got... Um, I was just sort of thinking about, uh, as I was ambling up there, I wouldn't recommend picking plants normally, but um, it's nice to demonstrate. The, we were just thinking the other day, whereas we had a practice run round about what foods and plants and birds would have been here at the same, the time when the prehistoric people were about. Um, and I mean, this is a plant called um, cleavers or... Um, Goosegrass. Goosegrass, yeah. So, and it's Gallium, its name is Gallium aparine. aparine or, uh, anyway, it's A-P-A-R-I-N-E. And I looked it up the other day, I hadn't, you know, because I thought, oh, that's interesting. And it comes from uh, aparine, or it comes from a Greek word called aparo, which means to seize. So it's, it has the little... Things to, to seize and get stuck on you, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> um, but apparently, yeah. Well, I didn't want to say that. But you could say that. Um, but um, everything has got a use. I, mean, I can't say that this plant was uh, it was would have been uh, amazingly useful for prehistoric people. But you can actually get red dye out of this. Um, and all these plants that you find in the hedgerows like this and. And in the grassland, like sorrel or dandelions or whatever, they're all full of vitamin C. And if you can actually find a way of preparing them, that they aren't too bitter, then, um, you know, it, that everything has its use. Um, I was just, the, we're surrounded by plants here, in actual fact that there's bramble here, which you just common a garden bramble. And um, 
if I can pick that, but uh, I think we all know what bramble looks like. Um, but we know that from an excavation, a uh, Neolithic uh, excavation, um, I think it was in Essex, that um, the, and presumably it was a waterlogged one because we wouldn't have the details, um, that uh, the seeds of uh, blackberries were found in um, a Neolithic person's uh, gut um, as, as a last meal type of thing. Um, it might be a last meal. So we know that they were obviously foraging on everything, nuts and berries, very, and it would have been a really big part of their diet and probably would have been much more sort of vegetarian than we are today. So they would be eating meat, but there was, they would have been um, digging up roots and rhizomes and all sorts of things. Um, and I didn't know, but there's some research has been done into blackberries and apparently it's full of fibre. Um, and, um, it, you know, so it, it actually will compete with a um, like wholemeal flour or whatever. So it's quite interesting. And most of this research, if you read these books about food for free and things, it says, oh, it may be good like this, you know, and it, you know, um, it, 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 this could do this and it could solve rheumatism or whatever, you know. <laughs> I mean, sting, sting nettles, which we find everywhere. I won't, I won't pull up because I'm sure you all know stinging nettles. Um, we've used them here to, uh, to make fibre and twine uh, when we've been making arrowheads, uh, arrowheads uh, uh, um, um, arrows, and using it as a twine to bind the um, stone, uh, the flint tip into the arrow, and to bind the feathers onto the other end. Um, and another thing I didn't know was that um, uh, it was used um, all the way through from prehistoric times to the 19th century as a, as a fibre for making, you know, a cotton type of material. And in the Second World War, the Germans made something like 2.5 million kilograms of um, a, a nettle fibre for military uniforms. So there you are, Mr. Google. <laughs> I happened to find that last night, and I thought that was quite interesting. So we, uh, and of course, stinging nettles are quite good. You can just sort of, if you've got rheumatism or something, you can just hit yourself with it and just distracts you from the pain. But the other interesting thing is, I mean, they, th these people would have been so knowledgeable in prehistoric times about the use of materials, and it's a whole other talk in itself. But um, some research done in 2015 found about dock leaves, which we all know we've grown up with, that you rub a stinging nettle uh, with a dock leaf. But apparently, it it's actually works much better if you use your saliva, because the enzymes in your saliva actually start to break down the chemicals in the dock leaf, which actually does the, uh, the more anti-inflammatory effect. That's why when you've got children, you, 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 you spit on it. If you have got a dock leaf, you would say... You spit on it, yes, yes. So... Um, Yes, so everything we're in, in, in and around us, I think, would have been edible in some form. There's the birch trees there. We know that if you, you know, as the sap rises in the spring, <coughs> you can get the sap out of, of that and, and actually make um, uh, a, a, a cordial, a sort of fairly sweet cordial. Um, they had crab apples. We now know, uh, we were talking about this as we were walking along, there was a, in the Bronze Age, they were uh, used as a, a ritual offering um, and um, probably they're quite sour, aren't they? So I imagine they would have used blackberries or something to uh, counteract that. So, yeah, it's endless, really. Um, it's a fascinating yeah, subject. There must, there must be so much trial and error as well, because yeah. you think we, we now know we can analyse the, mm. the chemical uh, makeup of, of plants <clears> and know we, what a poison off the, these people. Well, especially with fungi, for example, which would have been, you know, a big part of their diet, certainly in the sort of autumn time. And I'm sure mistakes were made, but probably not very often. But, and, well, and they might have been, because perhaps they, they weren't aware that, that, that it was the, that fungus that was actually killing for, for a while. And things like, you know, fungus, the key one was a little fungus called ergot, which grows on uh, grass seeds, which, because would have, grass seeds themselves, ground it would have been, a, you know, staple part of the, of the, the diet. They've got some of this ergot in them. It's, uh, yeah, it's, well, it could be fatal. 
but it could cause some, <laughs> some fairly severe psychological issues. And that's perhaps where this, this thing about witches came from, because people were behaving in a very strange way. And it's probably because they were eating bread with uh, with hmm. in them. It's interesting. So it's so all it's, um, it's absolutely it's fascinating, as Mark says. I mean, it's just quite endless. And of course, all the medicinal uses of these things. It was well, so we're, we're sort of coming forward a bit, but sort of medieval times, the the, the, the apothecaries then would have, would have gone round, and it, it was called the doctrine of signatures. So if a plant. For, for example, it was sort of had sort of um, red stems. Well, that must be a cure for blood disorders. And there's, there's things that, you know, there's um, lungwort, for example. It's, you know, it's, that must have been a cure. It's called lungwort. It's, it's sort of look like lung tissue. That must be a cure for, for any lung disease. And, and, and so, it, so it went on. And probably they just they would happen upon stuff that did work. It's like flea bane, and that's from to banish fleas. And its it, its scientific name is Pulicaria dysenterica, and that's a bit of a cure. Pulicaria pulis is, is flea dys dysentery, of course. It's, it's stomach upset. So it was used to well to banish fleas, and they they, they would get bunches of it, dry it, and and burn it slowly. Uh, Hanging from the from the doorways to the to the houses, uh, to get rid of fleas and other parasites. You can imagine these people, <laughs> absolutely even, and it probably worked because, you know, now we can do sort of chemical analysis. There are sort of natural insecticides in that, but how how on earth they, that was dis discovered, isn't that amazing? And of course, the dysenterica because it was thought you know by I can't remember what part of the plant it was, but you know it cured um, stomach upsets. So all, all these things, it's just, it's absolutely fascinating how all of this evolved from a very early age. Um, and so, yeah, in, incredible. And, and lots of the, the staple foods, vegetables we eat today, like you know, carrot and spinach and, and beet, those, they would have been developed from coastal species, you know, sea beet and wild carrot, and those that grow locally, and that's why most populations initially were uh, settling by the coast because not only did they have all that but then you know well obviously all the, the, the other seafood whether it's fish or shellfish or whatever so absolutely amazing I love what you know the, I could talk about that for, for ages but it, absolutely fascinating it, it is worth just having a just having a bit of research yourselves and you can come with all sorts like markets all sorts of little gems out there it's brilliant that's great. So, how are we doing for time? Oh, do we want to uh, move on? I, uh, I'm looking at Peter. Or somebody's got a watch on them. Obviously, we we need to. Just after eleven thirty. All oh, right. Okay. So that's good. So, we'll, sh do you think we should amble on? I don't know if we want to go in any further into the nursery. We might. It might be sensible to get on because we've got. Yeah. I think I'm going to hand my yes. microphone over to Kate. And we need to spend a bit of time when we get to the top, just relaxing, which would be nice. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to hand my microphone to Kate, and then she can talk to Stuart as we go through the woodland. And um, we'll be ready to Onwards. rock and roll when we get up there. OK. Jane uh, asking how many, how many um, cows in the herd, in this herd here? Um, we'll see the gate here. We'll keep I think altogether at Hengs, we've... we've uh, I'm not sure at the moment. I think it's about 20 something we've got, but they're sort of scattered over different um, paddocks at the moment. Oh, In here, yeah, what, they're four or five, I think. Quite right. But, um, yeah, that'll be one for the, for the rangers. Do you mind? Is that all right? I could. I just realised then that my other bag. <laughs> Come in, I 
walking that way. Well, it was a lifelong dream being allowed in the nursery. Oh, you get very far, didn't you? Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's hallowed ground in there. <laughs> you want to come back down again. We'll put you in there, lock you in there, put it in, enjoy it. Pretty good at climbing fences, so I'll be yeah. okay if I need to get out. But the little red plant was mossy stone crop. Tilia crasula. So easy to lose track of time when you're doing this. Mm, it's so nice just I know, along. just to walk along. That's all right. Yeah, I don't get something to. Something happens, uh, or the battery runs out. And <laughs> so Peter's got a spare battery. Yeah. I, I probably won't go much into the quarry detail until we actually get up there, because you said we do tend to lose signal sometimes through, oh, yeah, don't yeah, we? That's right. yeah. yeah, quite. Yeah. Come into your mind, but yeah. saying probably can't hear me, but uh, we're, we're quite far away with the signal. Yeah, I'll say that on the there's a bit we have to run now. <laughs> <laughs> we quite often lose signal in this yeah. part of the walk don't we yes, so yeah. just hang with us because it will come back especially when we get up to the top and get into clearer area so we won't we'll just sort of mumble along um but won't say anything sort of too in depth until hopefully a few more people can see us but if you've got any questions then fire away i just so i'm not on the microphone now but i just remember talking about bramble nothing i didn't i looked at up Bramble, and it said it's called moochers. Has anybody heard of that? No. Moochers in, in the West Country. Really? You don't talk about from mooching about, oh. just ambling along. Oh. You know, well, you don't just, mooch just when you touch it, though, do you? No. You do the opposite. But again, that's the thing with all of our wild plants, wild plants. They've, they've got, some of them have got you know, sort of 70 or 80 different names depending on which part of the country you come from, oh. especially you know, the more widespread they are. Which you said they're often bitter, bitter. these. Yeah. Mm. It sounds so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's great to discover. There's, there's also, I think there might be a, a small rookery again in here. Every so often, the, the rooks, and that's obviously a member of the crow family, and they nest communally. And I think there's a small rookery back in the, in the nursery woodland here. Probably not to the liking of the herons and egrets, but... 
My contribution was a long tail tit. Yeah. That's what I saw. Pretty sure it was. Can, can you hear that, that yeah, chacking, that chacking noise out here? Mm. What's that? That'll be, that'll be a black cap. Oh. And that's just, that's a little, I can see it actually. You can see this tree in front of it. Can you see about halfway up? Oh, it's yes. just, he moved. It's just. Two, two just flew along. He flew. Oh yeah. And that's oh, there. Yeah. That's, yes. a, that's a male. Oh. That's the male with his black cap. I can see that. The female's got actually his chestnut brown cap, but that's obviously, it might be us that's sort of causing a bit of consternation, but uh, something is upsetting. And I hear the blackbirds going as well, so there, there, there might be something around like a, a fox or m probably more likely to be a magpie or a jay, because they, these birds will be nesting now. Mm. But hopefully we'll, we'll hear some ma um, black cap, or it could be that. Well, here's some black cap song because it's a beautiful, fluid, liquid song. It'd be interesting, Stuart, that, that I haven't got a microphone on, but I used to repeat the because that if anybody can actually, if the microphones are picking up the background noise as well. Yeah. I think we've tried it before and it probably yeah. will get some of the closer birds. Yes. And, um, and the plane. <laughs> and and that's as well, yeah. No, Peter said it was picking up the bird song quite well. Yeah. So, so, yeah. That's good. But you, you can above the plane over here. You can you can hear there's a, there's a blackbird pinking yeah. away, oh. and that's a, again a sign that there's some something in there that they don't like. It could even be a, the, a tawny owl, for example. But um, but all <laughs> all tends to have that. All the other birds will pick up and they recognise each other's warning calls. Which there's is another one coming the other way. Crikey, in the middle of rush hour here. <laughs> oh, the black cap is singing now. Oh. We'll just let the colour gas lorry go the BBC by. BBC would have scheduled this. To, yeah. No interruption. <laughs> and another one, another one, careful. Oh, blimey. <sighs> Bronze Age so, people wouldn't have had to contend with that, would they? Just the odd cart. <laughs> so just now there's, there's a chaffinch singing. That's probably it there. Now a chaffinch, sometimes, with a little bit of imagination, if you can imagine Ben Stokes running into bowl <laughs> really, really quickly, and he releases the ball, and then he goes, "How's that?" <laughs> Not really. No, no that was no. <laughs> no ball. I think that one. <laughs> and can you see? The... Listen out for it. Sometimes it's brilliant. If mm. Until you actually want people to, yeah. to, to, to hear it. That was rubbish. Chiff chaff, yeah. Chiff chaff, yeah. Poor old chiff chaff. Chiff chaff. That, that's all that is. It's song. It just says chiff chaff, chiff chaff, chiff chaff. Awesome along. But it's lovely as part of the orchestra. It's beautiful, isn't it? In its own way. Uh, that's that's, actually, that's a, the chaffinch, that one, that's not the chip chaff. Can you hear the black cap in the background there? Lovely musical song. And again, another warbler, another migrant here. We've, we've got, there's, there's two warbler species in, in Britain that, that stay here all year round, that, and they're both, they both occur here and that's Dartford warbler which is a, that classic heath in the species might see one if we're very very lucky and anyone know what the other one is no, the other one is called a chetty's warbler oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah quite common and mainly more on the sort of around the the, the uh, wetter areas and with a really incredibly loud song
Okay, we better move on. Because this time of the birds, not one day, we hear a first light. It's absolutely magical. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it really couldn't be a lot better, could it? And especially in the woodland here, it's nice and sheltered. <laughs> you haven't got that cold wind, yeah. so it's, uh, nice hence why the birds are all singing today. It's, it's just homemade bread, oh. which is just slices of dry bread. But it's, it's got... Come and join us next time, Anne. Way. Three bananas, not a pot of yogurt. Lovely. Lots of, lots of flour, lots of seeds. Will um, Akeshka <coughs> take a smaller bird? Yes, yes if it gets a chance. I, that's what Mary and I saw um, a couple of days ago in the near forest. We were watching uh, mm. a female mm. chaffinch. Yeah. Well, right. About 20 feet away. Yeah. Just up with a branch. And then all of a sudden, this great big ruckus. <laughs> Akeshka would sweep down <laughs> and try to, try to grab it. Yeah, yeah. Together. Have you noticed as well as, as we as we're going along here, a lot of these trees have got ivy growing up them. Mm. Now it's a popular misconception that ivy is bad for the for the tree and it will kill it. And still today, people mm. chopping the ivy, killing it, which is the worst thing you do. It is an amazing habitat for mm. for wildlife, um, for for birds, for example. It creates lots of nice nesting places. It's got the, the flowers are very nectar rich for insects. So yeah, honeybees absolutely love them and, and other insects as well. And it's got a profusion of berries, which again, brilliant mm. for, for birds and small mammals. They absolutely do. Mm. And it's just really using that tree as a, as a support. It's not, it has its own root system. It's not, it's not affecting the nutrients of that, of that tree. Very occasionally, Especially if the tree is a little bit old and, and, and weakly, you might get a bit of an overload of, of ivy on it and it collapses. Well, that doesn't matter. That's part of the natural process. But I'd urge everyone, whether it's here or in your garden, just let the ivy grow the trees. It's, it's just a brilliant plant. And that's exactly right. There's a, a little butterfly called a holly blue, which should, will be on the wing now. And that actually lays its... It's eggs on mm. on hide on the, on the uh, ivy, as well mm. as holly and a few other plants as our well. But not so good here, so we probably should um, yeah make make our way up to the top. Of mm -hmm. I've been My neighbours cut some down, and I'm <laughs> I've cried for about a week <laughs> about the ivy. <laughs> um, but they managed to save some of it, and oh, as you I said. See. I think we've seen blackbirds nesting in it, yeah, actually. Absolutely. So. It's, it's there was an article recently saying that ivy on houses was good, good insulation. Yes, probably well, probably. I it. say it's, it's OK yeah. um, as long as the, the building itself isn't actually structurally damaged. It won't make any... It won't harm a building. If the building is already in a yeah. state of disrepair, then the ivy's going yes. to take advantage of that. Yeah. But uh, actually, if the building is sound... Yes. It's not really a problem. Yeah. No. Right. If I could grow one thing in my garden, that is now <laughs> what it would be. <laughs> I took some cuttings when my neighbours cut it down, and I'm waiting to see whether it's <laughs> whether it's grown.
Mm, aren't they really wonderful? Yes. I don't know what they are. Let's find out what they are. That looks like an oak. Uh, no. It's a bit dead. No, it's got leaves at the top. What's the? What are these trees? Can somebody? Right. These are. It's are mainly trees? oak trees in they here. Are oak, right. And this is, I mean, these aren't ancient trees by any means. That tree is perhaps 25, 30, mm. 40 years old, maybe. Mm. But there has been, if you look at old maps, there has been a woodland on this site because it's in the lee of the, mm. of the, of the, of the hill there. Mm. So it's a bit of, bit of shelter from mm. those harsh, mm. salt-laden sea winds. So the, the woodland can establish mm. here. But I guess so. that's where I kick in and say, actually, well, a lot of this isn't natural, though. So... This is spoil, all on this yeah. sort of north face and round to the um, the north face and the east face are generally spoil from all the quarrying that took place. So a lot of this 150 years ago wouldn't have been here. It would just sort of been kind of bare quarry. And they were quarrying material, which we'll talk about when we get up to the top, um, but they were bringing it down from this huge quine quarry which is now filled with water and a bit of a nature reserve and bringing it down into Holloway's dock which is no relation to these two I'm told apparently um the Holloway's dock no although he did have 12 siblings so surely you've got to be descended from one of those strange that I thought the the Holloway that was involved with the you read different reports because I read one that said that too. Mm. Mm. Actually, looking if you look on the Wikipedia article, they actually mention two different first names for this guy. So it just seems a little bit of. A... But it was definitely Holloway, and they would bring the material down from the from the quarry up here, and they would put it on barges in Holloway's dock when it would get sent back to Southampton. Now those barges were here because they had come from Southampton carrying coal. So what this guy did in... Um, so I guess we've always known that there is iron on Hengisbury Head. It's found in these really large nodules, which the quarrymen in the 1600s called them doggers. And we don't know where that term has come from. It isn't related to dogger land, which was the the bit of land that connected the UK to mainland Europe many thousands of years ago, that dogger comes from um, a Dutch sailing vessel, which was called a dogger. But, so we don't know the origin of the term, but they're massive lumps of iron carbonate, and the mineral name is ciderite. And if you put them in a furnace, you'll end up, it's about 30% iron. So it's not too bad. There's lots of silica in there, lots of quartz, so it's not the best kind of iron ore, but it's the best that we had. It's obviously been known about for thousands of years. Um, the uh, Iron Age people knew about it, the Romans knew about it, and Charles II knew about it because he sent out lots of people scoping the UK, trying to find sources for iron for his cannons to put on the ships. And apparently he did know that there was iron down at Hengersbury, but as far as I'm aware, he didn't actually come and quarry it. So it wasn't until 1848 that I think his name was James Holloway, um, or John Holloway. He started taking the doggers that had fallen out of the cliff on the south and, um, southwestern side of Hengersbury and he built a little tramway around the southern end and he started carting them onto this tram, bringing them around to the, the dock there. And he kind of sold the idea twofold. So he firstly said, oh, more traffic. So he, he kind of sold this twofold because he said, right, well, you can use them as ballast on the way back up to Southampton on your barges that have brought your coal in, but also you can then have them sent over to Wales, okay. and that's where they were smelted for their iron. So he kind of 
kind of have this, I guess it's a little bit of a dual purpose for taking out the doggers. So he first started quarrying them from, from the beach. And uh, I've got a, a little, um, oh, taking off my microphone. Quickly back on. Check you're working. Um, so I said he started taking them from the beach because they were easy pickings. So we're not walking around there today, but if you do walk along over the other side, on the south side, you'll see this. It's quite the familiar cliff at Hengisbury Head. And you can see the bands of the doggers in the clay here. So, and that's how they were falling out. So they were being eroded by the sea, falling out onto the, on the, onto the ground below them. But what they were doing is acting as a natural sea defence. So nowadays, we, we actually import rocks at the base of cliffs to try and protect them. If you go down to Barton, there's a huge mass of rock kind of groin there. I think there's actually some rock groins down um, just further along from Hingersbury Head. But these were acting as a natural rock groin and protecting the headland. That's why it's here. In theory, it shouldn't actually really be here. And without these doggers, you would just have a one continuous bay from Pool Bay round to Hurst Spit. So you wouldn't have Christchurch Bay. So these doggers are responsible for the head being here. So if you take them away, once they've fallen onto the ground, you're going to suffer from erosion. And that's what happened. So um, the public weren't very happy about this because what was happening is that Hengisbury Head was shrinking. Now we know it was bigger because... Got a couple of images here. That's one of them. Oh, and the other one is in a book. So we've got a lovely map here. This is a really great book if you're interested in on Hengisbury. It's Hengisbury the Story. Pick this up in a second-hand bookshop. And it goes through all of Hengisbury Head, the wildlife, the, the archaeology, the geology. And on page 147, and I remember that because it's the highest break that you can get in snooker, is a wonderful map here that was produced in 19, uh, 1777. And you can see, if you look carefully, and I'll show this round, it's got the double dike. And the double dikes curve round, as Mark said, in the northern side, um, but they also curve round at the southern side. And we're pretty sure this is a representative map. And it doesn't do that now because we've lost them into the sea. That part's gone into the sea, but they did curve round. And you would have thought that pretty much they would have built them symmetrically when they, when they built them all those thousands of years ago. And we can see from this overhead shot. Now, these photos were taken by an old professor of mine at Southampton University in West. He's given me permission to use these. Now, this is an aerial photo taken from a helicopter. And it shows the headland today. But can you see in the water there's these dark patches? Now, they think that this um, is material that originally came off the headland when it was out that far. So they think that this because they're in such straight lines that probably nothing would form that apart from an old coastline. This is, this is all on his website. And so this is where we think the original coastline went. So obviously much wider and it also was much longer as well. So all that quarrying caused it to shrink by several tens of metres. Now that upset the locals because even in the 1800s, this was a very popular place to come. But probably more importantly, it, it upset the Navy uh, because, because the, sh the end of Hengisbury has kind of shrunk this way. And if you are a ship, you cannot now hide in Christchurch Bay. And they were quite keen on doing that because they had advantage then over anything that was kind of coming up the channel near old Harry's Rocks, anywhere like that, that they could see them, but they wouldn't be able to be seen because they would be hidden behind the head. So the Navy started um, prosecuting this Mr. Holloway, saying, uh, well, actually, you're kind of trespassing because he claimed that the Navy owned anything to do with the sea. So anything below the high water line 
to the low water line where he had been taking all these doggers who actually belonged to the Navy. Um, and the Navy actually lost that case. The, the people, the solicitors at the time said, no, you know, Mr. Holloway really thought that he had access to all those doggers, they're his. So, but what it did is it kind of changed him as well as I think this environmental view of everyone was kind of like, you could stop destroying our headland. He started quarrying on the headland. Oh, well, that's all right. I can do it to these. I've, I've yeah. got a signal actually here, but oh well. maybe a different system. I think he wants to walk up that yeah. way. Okay, well, it's an appropriate time to then we can walk up there and continue the story. I think it just doesn't like me. I think it's just... No, it's not. It's, it's just, just, no, it's all right. This is a bad area here. That's all right. And well. that's why I went up to the top, because to make sure it wasn't my phone, it wasn't picking you up, so, you know. Um, then, well, that's you know, OK. You can always pick stuff when you get to the top. We gave you the, the dud card, though, so you did you start your bit in the... Well, I just thought I'd say something to our audience who are with us. Yes, yeah, no, it's good. Sorry for Facebook Live, but we've got a live audience here too. I'm going to strip off when I get up here. It's uh, oh. boiling. You've got the hat as well. Yeah. Wear today. Yeah, so I've got mine on too. It's freezing this morning. Mm -hmm. cycled down my hands by the time we got to the freezing. It was only about <laughs> half a mile. <laughs> It's on. <laughs> Have you been doing a private commentary for everybody? <laughs> We're now getting to the, well, the highest bits of the head. And the, the Heathen here, now Dorset, South East Dorset is, is renowned for its Heathen. We've lost so much of it. So this is just a small remaining fragment here. But this Heathen is really interesting because it's actually the climax vegetation because of the, the sea just in front of me here so all that especially this sort of salt laden winds it it suppresses the tree growth you can see there are a few stunted oaks in in here um but generally doesn't outcompete the the actual heath and by heath and i mean the the heathers and the gorse and the dwarf gorse is sort of ericaceous species here so most of our heathens these days, they are really quite intensely, intensely managed, and um, lots of scrub clearance, grazing, to actually keep them, them open. Which is, is good because that means we've got six native reptiles, um, they all can, can live there. Generally, heathen wants to be woodland, uh, but here that's, that's not the case. Now, of course, before we came along and started building houses and ploughing up the, the land and planting forests and really fragmenting, fragmenting all of this, there would just be this huge swathe, and it would have been a very dynamic system. There might have been, you know, it's, every, every so often there would probably be a, you know, a lightning strike and a fire, and it would open everything up and it sort of reset the clock. Um, and, that's, and it would be in different places. That then eventually over, you know, tens, hundreds of years we become woodland and then it would sort of go back again. So it's this and then lots of big grazing animals around the place. So a much more dynamic landscape and that's sort of our ancestors, that's what they would have have seen and witnessed. Um, but of course now we because I say we've got these little fragments like Hengus Head, a little fragment, a little nature reserve here. Looking around here it looks quite big, but generally in the grand scheme of things it isn't. And generally that's why we we've got our Grazing animals replicating those, you know, the, your aurochs and your, and your uh, there's, there's been things like elk and moose and these sorts of things wandering around at will. But even so, that said, now we've got, before, before you just came and joined me then, there was a, some linnets singing here. And this is where we found, so I mentioned the Dartford warblers earlier, that's where they, they would have been found. And again, that, that would probably been a familiar, familiar bird. So the people, they wouldn't have known it as a Dartford warbler um, because 
It's named after Dartford in Kent, and probably Dartford in Kent didn't exist then. <laughs> well, not probably, it didn't. <laughs> but we put modern names to, to these. So, but again, you know, did these people have names for these different words? They must have done yeah. in their own languages. Again, that fascination about what, you know, what, how they, they saw these, what they called these, these birds, what they knew about these birds. They probably knew not much about things, you know, Dartford Warm, not much use to them. But the bigger birds, certainly things like the waterfowl, and there would have been, you know, like here, there's been lots of, of wetland areas full of geese and things like cranes and, and white storks, um, herons, and these would have been good because that's food. And it might have been, you know, whether they, they got the actual, the, the adult birds or the, the young and eggs. I'm sure they would have been gleaning lots of those. And they would have been very familiar with things like big birds of prey, like white-tailed eagles. And the brilliant thing is, in fact, only about three weeks ago, we had white-tailed eagles over here. Oh. Because you may already be aware, but mm. just over there on the Isle of Wight, mm. at present, there is a white-tailed eagle reintroduction programme going on. Mm. That's right, because that, this was the last place in England where there were white-tailed eagles. They were persecuted to extinction. In, in Britain, and there's been some very successful reintroductions um, on, well, a mole was the classic one, that was the first one, but it's happening right here on our doorstep. Mm -hmm. And to be able to see, I actually saw the, the birds, to actually see that wow. fantastic sight. And this, is, this eagle, you know, this has got like a almost three metre wingspan. This is a big bird. And it's just fantastic that we can actually appreciate, we can see that and appreciate the wonder of that. And, and of course, these, these guys would have, they probably revered these, these things. They, and, they, and again, they, they were probably, certainly if they found, you know, dead ones, the, the feathers would have been used either as, as for ornament or, or, or you know, decoration or, or in rituals, all these sorts of things. That, uh, and I don't know, Kate, you might know a bit more about how how that uh, how that developed, I, but I, I don't know. But and of course we don't know exactly. Yeah. But it's just a, it's fascinating to think. I mean, you look at the native Indian culture and like you know for their decoration for the headdresses and things like that, and how they use condor feathers. These big birds were really sort of iconic for them. Mm. Mm. I think Mark would be the one to talk about the feathers and things. But Mark, have they found feathers in in burials? Have they found what? Feathers. Not that I, I, I don't know. No, I don't have not. Not at this site, as far as I know. No. I, I mean, we know that they carry those sort of things with them. I mean, the famous um, Uxi, which um, the um, Oh, the Mesolithic uh, man in, found it in Europe. Of, uh, yeah. I think it was Mesolithic, but they found it in the Alps. He had a whole, a whole toolkit with him, you know, the pouch and um, um, all the things that you need to light a fire with, etc. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think a lot was discovered from that, just that one um, person who was frozen up there in the Alps and then suddenly mm. it melted and so whether they kind of ever saw, you know, huge ones as a, you know, people collect yeah. them now, I'm whether sure it's seen as a trophy kind of thing. Mm. Um, somebody, a bit more oh, well, where's Hayden when you need him? Yeah, it's where he's, he's <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Just yeah. we're, we're, we're in a bit of a hurry, so we are keeping them. But just keep your eye out. There's little things like this. This is greatest stitch word in fan a classic spring species. And I don't know if you've noticed.
flying around us now. Yeah. As we've mentioned, the, the San Martins. Yeah, they're everywhere. Here, so they're, so they're nesting in the, in the cliff face yes. over here. So they're up here just feeding on any insects they can, they can find over the, over the heathland. So carrying on about the mining, so um, don't know how much was caught on Facebook Live. Sorry if you missed that bit, but we've moved a bit forward in time. So um, probably public pressure from from yeah from local communities and also the navy meant that the mining shifted from the beach to where we came up and we saw the large kind of quarry area there now there is another little quarry down the side some of you might know that as the lily pond yeah. that's actually where the horses drank so that was actually put there for the horses that would carry the carts um, of, of the stone that was being quarried but in i think it was 1856 the quarrying moved up here and he dug a massive pit and kind of gouged out some of the side of that eastern face so it was easy to kind of put in pylons and cranes and get the material from that quarry down into the barges and off to southampton and then probably over to wales that all stopped in about 1870 so again public pressure but probably more likely what happened was that the price, it just wasn't viable anymore. We were getting iron ore, better iron ore from other places. I mean, the UK owned half the Commonwealth and we could get it cheaper in other, other places. So he stopped mining in 1870. So since then, there's been no mining at Hengisbury Head. And it's kind of settled back now into a kind of semi-stable state. It's made a lot more stable by the long groin that we can see um, of Peter terms up there. That's the long groin there, so that captures all the sediment that comes from the southwest because that's the, that's the main fetch of the sea, comes from the southwest, so it brings all the material and kind of dumps it along here, and we now get a protected headland. Not so good for the people over at Barton because the material used to go over to them. Uh, and so hence their cliff is falling into the sea instead, unfortunately. But Hengisbury Head, for the moment, is relatively stable. So I think if we're going to walk up to where the reindeer camp was, is that right? The rain, or the archers camp? Archer camp this was up here. Um, and we'll talk then a bit more about the geology millions and millions of years ago. And also some of the archaeology as well. Obviously got a nest just below the uh, cliff top here. They'll probably just keep popping. Um, what was, what was the purpose? We are just discussing why there were the odd fences on the top of Hingsby Head that run perpendicular to the, uh, perpendicular to the cliff top. And it's because in the 1970s, there was a huge amount of erosion all the way through here. And so the council at the time decided to put fences so that you had, it pushed you inland each time, rather than fencing off the whole cliff top and then the whole fence going over when the cliffs have eroded. So, they, so they've been kept and renewed over time, and it has worked quite well, really. And then we put these new footpaths in, which are essentially tarmac, but they've got that golden grit on, so they work really well anyway. But, uh, yeah, that's the reason, <laughs> yes. About 40 years ago, my son probed 
interesting looking part of the cliff, that, that long yes. post. And after about three, four years, every year it came back to measure. Yes. They were gone. Really? I must have been here at that time, probably. He was yes. a, doing his um, geography. He was a yes. Yeah. The road, yeah, I mean, it does go in phases. Kate will probably tell us more about that, but mm. uh, it go, you know, you can, you know, you get very little erosion for a, a decade, and then you get a whole massive amount of erosion. So we're we're here on the the Mesolithic site, the Middle Stone Age site, just to tell you where we are, and then Kate's going to talk a bit more about the landscape and everything, and what it would have been like million years of years ago, all the way up to the present. Um, but this, this little site here, those of you who've come on a walk before will know this is one of my favourite spots because it's, it's uh, um, we'll t talk to you about that in a minute, but it's a Stone Age camp. Um, but it's just a lovely place to sit and look out to see which we'll, what we're going to do for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm going <laughs> to hand you over to Kate and she's going to, Struggling as our microphone. resident geologist, tell you um, what it's all about. Okay, well, I was trying to think about how to do this, and I'm going to talk about kind of four geological episodes of time, I guess. So we're going to go back, if we had a time machine, and imagine 100 million years ago where there would have been no plane, and we would have actually been at the bottom of a sea. So we would have been in a completely different place on the Earth. So the tectonic plates have moved over time, and about 100 million years ago, which was the Cretaceous period, there were dinosaurs roaming around on what was land. That's not where, we didn't have any land here. Um, but we were kind of further towards the equator. So I don't think we were down quite as far as the equator, but we were a bit further south. But more importantly, it was very, very hot. It was one of the hottest times that there's ever been in geological history. And there weren't any ice caps. Now we think that it was really hot because there was a lot of volcanic activity, so there's a lot of gases being put into the atmosphere. And kind of a natural greenhouse had kind of taken over the earth at the time. So no ice caps mean high sea levels. So potentially sat here, we would have had maybe 100 metres of water on top of us. We're talking really seriously, you know, deep water. And there was not really a lot of river input. A lot of the land at the time near us was quite flat. So the sea was, was warm, it was calm, and what was forming in the bottom of it was chalk. And chalk is formed when you get plankton and algae that are made of little shells of calcium carbonate. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, and when they die, they rain down to the bottom and they fall out on the sea floor. And this keeps on happening and it takes about two and a half thousand years to get about an inch of sediment. So it's a really, really long time. And we've got hundreds of meters of chalk in this area. So it was very quiet for millions of years and it allowed that chalk to build up. So that's the case of a hundred million years ago. Now we haven't got any chalk at Hingersbury Head now. Um, that's because it's buried down several hundred meters below our feet, but it is there. And I'll talk a bit more about that. But what happened then, so that's 100 million years ago. Let's move forward in time to about 40 million years ago. So the dinosaurs have all died out by then. It's got a bit cooler, so we haven't got as much volcanic activity going on. And we're slightly further north. So we're probably about where Gibraltar is now. So that's where the UK was, so it's a little bit warmer. But the chalk that was laid down at the bottom of the sea has now been pushed up through earth movements and is at the surface. So that's what the geological plates can do. They, and when sea levels can fall a bit or the land rises, and that's what happened with the chalk. And this whole area, if we were here 40 million years ago, we would have had, probably if we look towards pool, um, we would have seen a really, really large kind of river, like a braided river. If you've ever seen any of those on TV, they're sort of a kilometre or so wide, lots of little rivulets coming in. And this, we know, flowed all the way from at least Devon, because 
uh, the pool pottery um, was made from a very, very fine clay. And that clay comes from granite. And the nearest granite round here is in Dartmoor and Exmoor. So we know that this river was bringing material down. Um, probably similar, it came into Wareham near the where the Froom and the um, Piddle are. Is that the two rivers over there? And then it emptied out. And we see evidence of that because we see the sands in the Bournemouth cliffs and all of that sand was what was deposited by these rivers over millions and millions of years and that is kind of the lowest level if you like of Hengersbury Head is we call it the Boscombe sand but then the earth is is a dynamic planet so we had this this massive river but not very far away we had the sea and sometimes sea levels rose and would come over all of that sand and we would get clays being deposited. When you get higher levels of sea, you can get the soft sediment settling out. We get clay being deposited. And that's the kind of the second stage 40 or so million years ago is that this whole area then was under the sea and the rivers weren't very far away. We know that because we find bits of wood and, and tree seeds in our clay. We know that it was deep enough to harbour sharks and whales and, and sea snakes. We find evidence in the fossils. And it was quiet for a very, very long time, maybe 10 million years or so, with maybe, again, sometimes the sea level dropped and we get a little bit coming in from the rivers, but more or less it changed into kind of a marine environment. And that probably under where we're sitting now is where the Barton clay starts coming in above the Boscombe sand. So we moved from lagoonal and tidal and estuary into marine. And any of you that are familiar with the Barton clay know that it's really fossil rich. You can find shark's teeth, you can find lots of shells. And I've got some examples of those here. Um, so that's a nice, there's some shark's teeth there. And this is a tarotella, so this was a gastropod shell. Now these are from Barton, but we should technically be able to find them in the clays underneath us because it's the same rock, but we don't. They're not there. They were there, but they've been dissolved away. And we're not entirely sure why. Mark, have you heard a reason for why that is? No. In no. fact, <coughs> in fact I, I wasn't really aware that that's what what's the cause of not, them not being there. Yeah, so, it's, so I'm learning it should actually be there. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> They've done in-depth <coughs> studies. So the doggers that we talked about, mm. these big ironstone blocks, very occasionally they will contain shark's teeth. So we know that we're talking about an area that was marine and it's got a mineral called glauconite in it, which is only associated really with the sea. And we find molds of these. Um, one of my pictures shows, again, this is from a thin section of, a, of one of the doggers. I'll show that to the camera first. We can see imprints of these shells. You can see there. So these are casts. So the shell was there and it's been dissolved mm -hmm. away. I can take it now if you want. Oh, OK. Yeah, well, I yeah, yeah. can see that far, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> is that all right? So there's a, there's a couple of theories yes. about where there's these shells have gone. Shells because if you go to Barton, you, you're stumbling over these shells. There's falling out of the cliffs. You, you, you can go, if you don't find one, then you're having a really bad day because they're, they're really common, especially, especially these guys. Um, yes, the shells. So yeah. there's lots of peaty material. Stuart was saying there's, there's, there's heathland on top of the headland here. It's possible that, that rainwater, it's quite acidic soils so it's possible that the rainwater has percolated down and um, dissolved some of the um, material and made the rainwater slightly more acidic and dissolved the fossils that way it's possible that there is pyrite around and when pyrite reacts with water and oxygen you get a form of sulfuric acid that can dissolve fossils uh, but you would expect probably that those things would have happened over at Barton because there would have been heathland at Barton. There obviously isn't today. It's all built up, but there would have been. And there's, there's a lot more pyrite actually over at Barton than there is here. So another theory is that 
Um, there's actually a fault that runs, a geological fault that runs up Christchurch Harbour and it follows probably the River Stour. And in fact, actually the River Stour follows the fault. That's probably why it's there. And when you get faults, you get liquids and fluids coming up from deeper down. So there might have been some acid rich fluids that have come in because we're a lot closer to the fault here than at Barton. It's possible that acids came up and dissolved all the fossils away. And it's a great shame because it would be wonderful if we could walk along the beach here like we could at Bart and then just pick up shells. But they are there, but you mostly will find the casts and, uh, and not really, you know, fossils in, in their original form. And there's a, just talking about sulfuric acid, a friend of ours, um, Robin Walls, who was a um, water scientist in Christchurch, he did, when I was first here in the 1980s, he did some work looking at the pH of the pond because the, the quarry pond was only formed in the 1970s when it was dammed off and we had really low pH levels yeah. there. I think it was pH 3 or something. I mean, it was very acidic and, and a lot of influence of sulfuric acid and I can't remember exactly how that formed but that's to do with the salt sprays and things, I think, isn't it? Isn't yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that's, mm. that's probably... Yeah. Uh, Possibly another So what reason. you were saying is, yeah. is probably, I've never really thought about it before, but mm. could be. Yeah. It's mm. hard because the clay's quite impenetrable, really. Clay's very um, sticky and it's not like a sand. It's not very porous. So it's, it's very interesting how it, managed, it has managed to completely just obliterate every single fossil here. So that's kind of 40 million years ago. Then if we go to 20 million years ago, uh, this area, again, which was at the bottom of this sea, has been subjected to earth movements and has come to the surface again and pretty much looked to some extent the whole of the UK as it does now. They think it was probably 20, 10 million years ago that it hasn't really changed very much in that time. But something that did change, especially the south coast, was the formation of the Alps. So that, that's been going on for, for tens of millions of years. And even though we're quite far away from those two tectonic plates squishing together, we do see the evidence here and we see it on the small scale. So if you go down to Lulworth Cove, just next to Lulworth Cove is a wonderful little kind of, it's not even a bay, it's forming, it's a bay that's starting to form. It's called Stair Hole. And it's, if you look towards the east, it's got a wonderful fold in it. It's called the Lulworth Crumple. And that is because of the earth movements that were being made down in the Alps, but we got the kind of tiny effects of those. One of the major, one of the major effects of that, and that's kind of affected our area, is that the layers in this area kind of got turned into a bit of a bowl, into a bit of a basin. You might have heard people sometimes call, refer to the Hampshire Basin, and that's kind of what we're in now, and it's, it's, the, the chalk that has, as I said, been folded into kind of a bowl, all those sediments that have been laid on top of it, all of those river deposits, all of that marine deposits have all been kind of bent. And in North Dorset, that's kind of marked by sort of the, the hills around Badbury Rings and, and Wiltshire and the downs there. But in the south, it's really marked by the chalk ridge that extends through the Isle of Wight and out to the Needles and then again we find it if we go over to Old Harry and through the backbone of the Purbex there and that's pretty much the chalk layer has pretty much tilted on its side and makes a really strong ridge so that was all about sort of 20 million years ago um, and so what I wanted to, this is a bit these guys wouldn't have been here 20 million years ago but this chalk ridge that's kind of envisaged in the back would have been so if we've got that and this chalk ridge persisted for many many years many millions of years and it's envisaged pretty much that when the stone age people were here that that ridge would have been in place and that's quite important because it means there would have been no sea here whatsoever the sea wouldn't have breached let you take it lovely thank you the sea wouldn't have breached and so this whole area was then a river valley and it was the proto Solent. So the Solent today we know kind of comes down over the sort of north yeah. middle of Hampshire been, down through Southampton mm -hmm. but originally it flowed exactly <laughs> where Pool Bay is and we know that we've got seismic da data of um, this river Distinct. like down cutting and so this would have been quite a kind of low etched area so that when the sea did invade 
it had somewhere to go into. It was already kind of carved out by the, these, mm. this river. So if we go to two million years ago, we've still got our chalk ridge, but what we've got are very different temperatures. So the UK is pretty much where it is now. <laughs> two million years ago isn't really very long geologically. And we've got ice sheets covering the UK. And this happened four or five times. They, they never came down as far as Hengsbury Head. They came down as far, we think about the M4, so I think between <clears throat> Bristol and London. But what we did suffer, I suppose, in this part of the world was the meltwater stream. So when glaciers and ice sheets melt in the summer, it's quite catastrophic because you've got hard ground in the winter that's just frozen for months and months of the year. And then suddenly you just get all these meltwater streams rushing down over miles and miles of land. And they covered this whole area in kind of glacial outwash, if you like. So if you dig down in your garden in Bournemouth, you're gonna come across sands and gravels. And that's what that's from. So that's not from these really early deposits 40 million years ago. This is from things brought down 2 million years ago from these, these glaciers. And something quite wonderful sometimes happens if you're digging like my mum did in her garden, um, because what these rivers did is they eroded over lots of different rocks, but one of those was this chalk over sort of in, in North Dorset. And in the chalk, we sometimes find sea urchins now, actually, Peter, you've got relevant sea urchins as well. So that's a modern day sea urchin. Very fragile, brittle little guy there. <laughs> but when they fossilise, they usually fossilise with silica, so a form of quartz, and they fossilise in the chalk. And my mother found this rather attractive little guy just in the back garden, just digging, because they're brought down with all the other sands and gravels. So you've got something that is 100 million years old in your deposit that is only half a million years old, even less sometimes. And this is one we found at Barton, again, that's come down. It's not, it's not formed in the Barton clay. This has formed, this has been fallen down onto the cliff face. And uh, you can search for these on the beach there if you're lucky. We managed to find one of those there. And we've actually got some sort of modern day um, sea urchins. They're very tiny. We'll pass these round, but anyone that's been looking at any local site in Bournemouth might have heard about these little pansy shells or I don't know what, um, old um, sand dollars people call them as well. And these are tiny sea urchins that have kind of appeared on our beaches within the last months with all the dredging that we've been doing. So they're actually, I think, from the other side of the Isle of Wight and they have been caught up. You know, they, they, they were dead before we nabbed them, I'm pretty sure. But they've all, be, oh, they've all come in with the, with the grit and the sand that's been dredged recently and ended up on our shores. So these were picked up under Boscombe Pier the other day and I went down and there's still some there. And again, they've got this five, this mark, marked five symmetry that all of these sea urchins have. They've got these, um, they're in, they're, their symmetry is, like, is five. They're related to a starfish. You think about a starfish and a starfish curled up. That's basically what a sea urchin is. Um, so that's it, I think. So the, the glaciers and that last pouring of, of massive amounts of material over the last million years. And then probably about only 10,000 years ago, at the ending of the last ice age, was when the chalk ridge was breached. So until then, Hengisbury still would have been a hill. It would have obviously been much bigger. We know that. We've seen that before the quarrying took place. And so it would have been a great place to hunt. It would have been a great vantage point. We would have seen down into the river valley here. And this also would have been a really marshy, boggy river. Um, great for hunting, you know, herds of whatever walking around. And then the, the rivers that were all coming down. So they would have been our familiar rivers. They would have been the Stour, the Avon, the Bourne. They breached through that chalk ridge they think about 10,000 years ago, the sea was coming up through from the English Channel at that point, and they met, and then the rest of history, it just breached, and, and we've got what we've got today. But that's very recent in geological time that we've actually had a sea here. But it has always been a, a lower area prone to, to river flooding, I suppose. So that's it. Brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we're well over time. <coughs> Hopefully, oh, there's a, is that a cinnabar moth? The red one. Oh, it is. It's just... Mm.
Yeah. <coughs> Getting ready to lay some eggs on some ragwort or something. Mm. I'm growing it in my garden specially. Yes, I let it grow if it mm. comes up. Mm. I noticed there's quite a lot where the cows, cows were feeding earlier. Oh. You, you don't see many of those caterpillars anymore, do you? They come in waves, yeah, but there's certainly not enough caterpillars to get rid of ragwort. <laughs> well, that was great. And um, just to finish off, if, if we've still got anybody with us, we've been here, probably gone over time a bit, but uh, it's just been really relaxing just doing this and listening. We could just, um, I could just finish off um, and just say about the, the, the Stone Age people that were up here. And um, we're actually sitting on um, what we call the Middle Stone Age campsite. Um, and a little bit further down the coast, <clears throat> for the, those of you who know Hengsby Head, there's the long groin that sticks out there. And right just above there is the Old Stone Age um, uh, camp. <clears throat> um, and that would have been what in, 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 in the sort of the strict time of it, an upper Paleolithic site, but we can call it Old Stone Age. And this is the Middle Stone Age, so that was um, 10, 11, 12,000 years ago. This is 9, 10,000 years ago. And then following on from this, we had like the Neolithic people who were the first farmers to come to Hengisbury Head um, and first people who were a bit more sedentary. but. Where we're sitting now is an, where, which was excavated in the 1980s by Nick Barton from Oxford University. It was, an, it was a rescue excavation. We're quite near the, the cliff edge, a bit nearer than they were in the 1980s now. Um, but it's just a lovely little bowl here. And you can just imagine um, um, this, uh, uh, a, a small gathering of people, perhaps a couple of families who were migrating around. This is a great vantage point. It's safe. You're up looking, like Kate was saying, looking out into the river valleys that were on both sides. <coughs> Those of you who know um, St. Catherine's Hill, if you were to go stand <coughs> on top of St. Catherine's Hill, you might get perhaps a more feel for what it might have been like being in land with the river valleys and, and open land on either side. <coughs> so it would have been safe. They could have spotted herds of uh, deer and um, aurochs and all sorts of other creatures um, uh, moving around the river valleys. It would be a great place to, to um, hunt for fish, uh, collect eggs and birds, and Stuart know all about that. <coughs> I think you mentioned that there might have even been a cranes around at the time, but I don't know. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, nuts and berries and that, that type of thing. But, the interesting part of it here, why we we're sitting here, is the excavation found hundreds and hundreds of little microliths. And the little microliths were the points, they made these points to insert into um, a shaft of wood. And unfortunately this little arrow <clears throat> from our collection has decided to break on the way here. But nevertheless, you can get the picture. So it's a, a wooden dowel. This is actually this has been uh, made obviously by an expert previously to today, and we mentioned um, uh, uh, um, stinging nettles to make thread and twine. We have experimented, and we've done it on one of our little um, uh, events like this um, using um, that is twine, and then making glue. So it's these little points that were found that have been inserted um, into this shaft. And um, this is what they found here. So they found all the, the, the rubbish, what they call it debitage, lots and lots of pieces of flint and all these little points that were being manufactured for their hunting equipment. So obviously hunting and hunting animals was pretty important at the time. If you were an old Stone Age person here 11, 10 or 11,000 years ago, you wouldn't have this technology because it was much more like tundra then and it was very open and people hunted with spears and had different techniques. But by the time you get to the Mesolithic, <coughs> it's, it, it's starting to get more woodage and you've got things like um, pine and birch and uh, alder and other things coming in, taking over the environment. So it becomes more wooded so you can, go, um, they, you can go and hide behind things and trees and bushes and things and creep up with animals with your bow and arrow. 
So a climate change and a change in the ecology force a change in technology, just like it does today. You know, we're, you know, we have a pandemic and now we're all, you know, really good users of Zoom and all that technology, which we never thought we'd be interested in. So it's, it's amazing how a, a change in the environment creates a change in technologies. And that's always what's driven human behavior. So there's lots to talk about here. We've, we've made, they, they obviously made all sorts of tools. This is a, um, a, a, an ax head, which could be inserted into a piece of wood and used to chop down trees. Um, and if you want to look at any more sophisticated um, pieces like this, you can come to the um, museum at Hengisbury Head or our visitor center. Um, I won't dwell on this too much. Here's a, here's a very nice blade or scraper. And um, they, they made tools for all sorts of purposes. So like in your kitchen today, you'd have knives and forks and spoons and a serrated knife. Um, they made things for uh, what we call scrapers, which you could scrape the hide clean, uh, as something like this. And, um, and also for blades for cutting materials. It's, it's a very sharp material, flint. And it would have been made, it, it, they would have probably have collected flint, possibly from where we see the Isle of Wight today. Um, I don't think anybody's actually tested the flint to see exactly where it's come from. Um, but they would have, oh, if I can tip these out, I'll never get them back in again. Um, but, there we are. So, <clears throat> they would have a piece of flint, and I'm not going to do this here, but a, a, a flint core, or as we call it, uh, you find the, the work piece of flint and the... If Hayden was here, he would be able to do a much better uh, story about this. But anyway, if he's watching, I apologise. But we would use a, a cobble or a piece of bone or a piece of antler and we would strike the flint and when you strike it like that into your hand, blades like that will come off from underneath like that. So you can take your blade and put it like that. And once you've got these little pieces, you can do all sorts of things with it. You can um, create um, little uh, shapes into it, which then you, which you could, uh, what we call like a spoke shave. I don't know if you can see that. It's like a little curve, and I could run that up and down a piece of wood like this, and clean off the bark, etc. We can also take something like that and two pieces of flint and actually cross one against the other. I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't see what I'm doing. So I've made a little serrated knife like that. I know you probably won't be able to see that, but I can show you after. So, you know, we would use a serrated knife for something different to a, a, a sharp blade, wouldn't we? So all this has been going on up here, um, including feathers. We talked about feathers earlier. And they do fly. I don't know if you can. There we are. <laughs> um, and so we know that they were manufacturing tools um, and weapons like this. And we've done a little bit of this ourselves. We can make our own glue um, from beeswax. That's a piece of beeswax which is sort of melted down honeycomb. And in my little tin here, we also have pine resin. We talked about pine resin, uh, or we talked about resin, didn't we, birch and things, but we can get pine resin out of, out of, a, birch, out of a pine tree and, and collect that. Um, we just buy this on Amazon, in actual fact. But, um, um, and we can mix pine resin with beeswax to make a fairly effective glue. And if you mix a little bit of carbon in with it, you can make it stickier or harder. And where would we get carbon from? Well, just from our fire, wouldn't we? So we just, you know, the fire at the end of the day, we just grind up some, uh, some of the burnt embers, charcoal effect, and we can mix that in with it and then it, it affects the hardness or stickiness of the glue. And we had some fun down 
on one of the previous ones earlier, and I think it was in March we, we tried this, and it, it was quite different. And, you know, the glue we could make, and it, it's quite useful if the glue's quite sticky. If it goes too hard, it goes too brittle, um, and then it just sort of fractures and breaks off. So. so all this was just happening just here. It's a tiny little story about a much bigger story. Um, and I just sort of think, sitting here, we can, you can really, it's a bit like looking up at the stars. I mean, you could do that. The ultimate uh, thing would be to sitting here, looking up the stars, talking about Stone Age people, imagine what it was like, um, and really getting into that frame of mind. Um, and in the, just one other thing, if you go um, after March the 19th, when we finally open, have a look, there's a core um, that's been put to get back together that Nick Barton who did the excavations up here. So he's taken all the little pieces and managed to jig a 3D jigsaw and put them all back together again. But what, and so that's actually in the, um, on show down there. But what is even more amazing, he actually went to all sorts of different museums to find different parts of the, the core which had been taken in different collections when it has been excavated at different times since the beginning of the 19th century. So that, that is a really amazing piece. That was done in the 1980s, and I think probably one of the first times that had been done. And so what you think about it, you can actually get into the mind of that very person who was actually, how did they do it? In which order did they take off each flake? And then you can learn how, from that person, exactly how he or she made it. Um, we probably could say he, because we know that people had very separate roles probably that the women would be carrying their children and hunting and gathering and, and, and carrying picking nuts and berries and that sort of thing it tends to make sense but it doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't making the tools etc we don't really know um, and certainly the young children would have been well in, involved in all those things because if they didn't do it they wouldn't survive um, so I think We've run well over time, but thank you. I could, so I don't know if Stuart's got anything else to say. I could throw my microphone over to you or Kate. Um, I think I've said enough. I can give you my microphone if you want. <laughs> I hope you didn't get that on camera. <laughs> well, I think it's just, it's just absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I mean, that's, the, that's the sense you get here. I mean, you can really sort of put yourself where those people were and start to really think about what they were doing and, and how intelligent they were and how progressive with, with, the, with the technology. It's just absolutely fascinating. I, I, just, I just love to li listen to these, these stories. It's just, just, just remarkable. And it's, it's the time scales as well. <laughs> Kate's I mean, going about 100 million years. It, it almost becomes incomprehensible, doesn't it? But it's just remarkable how how that, how that, it's the geology, isn't it, that's actually shaped everything at the, at the end of the day. Uh, and that's produced, that's actually produced the flint, and, and, which has become a major tool for, the, for all these people. But um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. And while, while we were talking there, I was just sort of looking out to sea and as, as a, a gannet just drifted past one of a really big <laughs> seabirds, you might say a big white seabird. And you think these people have seen that and you think, probably lots more of these things and we all know there's been a decline in, in species in our lifetimes but then before there's any human real human influence that absolutely amazing and again it'd be great to be able to put yourself back here then and see the what must be a profusion and here's a former going past <laughs> very low which yeah you think that's remarkable because Martha and I saw <laughs> probably the same bird on, on Thursday and and the, the numbers of those birds that there, there, there would have been around here. And then again, that would probably have been a bird that, that was taken for food, certainly the, the eggs and young, uh, as they still are today in, in, in some parts of the, of the world. So, um, yeah. And, and we're so very lucky because it's, it's here, and I'm assuming most of you are local. And to me, living near somewhere, you kind of actually forget the geological history because everywhere on Earth has a geological history. But it's the history that it was occupied by humans and it was important to them for whatever reason and those reasons changed over time 
And I, I just love the fact of sitting here, knowing that there would have been people sitting here 6,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, and, and you can handle, well, you can handle the flints that they touched. And that's, I don't know, it's just such, so, this, it is connecting to the past. I mean, I know this is performing the past, and but it's connecting to that, to that past in a way that in other places in the country, this doesn't have as much a rich history. I suppose. We're just very lucky. That's my way of saying that, you know, come down and just come down and enjoy Hengisbury, whether you like the archaeology, whether it's the geology, the nature. There's always something new to see and hear. And um, we were talking about the stars, hopefully in the in the summer and maybe more into the winter as well. We'll we'll actually come up here at night and do some stargazing and maybe look at the meteor showers. And again, that's what they would have done because they would have had no light pollution and that would have been their entertainment in the evening. They would have gathered around a fire. They would have told their stories. And then probably when the fire died down and people started drifting off to sleep, they just would have looked up and who knows what they would have thought about all of that up there. You know, that's a whole completely different story. They would have made up their own constellations, theories about the moon, you know, what that was. If something new happened, if there was a massive fireball, you know, sign from heaven, well, they probably didn't have heaven, whatever they had at that time. Um, so we'll hopefully be doing that in the summer as well. Obviously, you can't do that in the, in the daytime. We need the nighttime. So, and thank you to Mark and Peter and Stuart and all of you for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.